Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Hello and welcome to today's virtual Commonwealth Club event. My name is Ladaris Cordell. I'm retired Superior Court judge, author of Her Honor, and your moderator for today. It is my pleasure to introduce our two guests, Bill Keller and Lenore Anderson. Bill Keller is the author of What's Prison For? Punishment and Rehabilitation in the Age of Mass Incarceration, and he's the founding editor-in-chief of the Marshall Project, an independent nonprofit news organization focused on crime and punishment in the United States. Bill previously spent 30 years at the New York Times as a correspondent, editor, and op-ed columnist. Welcome, Bill. Lenore Anderson is the author of In Their Names, the untold story of victims' rights mass incarceration, and the future of public safety. And she is founder and president of the Alliance for Safety and Justice, a multi-state organization that aims to replace over-incarceration with more effective public safety solutions and support for crime victims. Lenore was also the former chief of policy at the San Francisco District Attorney's Office and former director of public safety for the Oakland mayor. Before we get started, I encourage you all to submit any questions for Bill and Lenore through the chat on YouTube. So let's get started. Uh, welcome to both of you. Um, initially, I wondered why the club asked me to be in conversation with both of you. One, Bill Keller, the author of a book on America's prisons, and then Lenore, Anderson, the author of a book about victims' rights. What's the connection, I thought? So I read each book and voila, I think I got it. Um, What's Prison For and In Their Names are important books. If you, like me, think that you know enough about our prison system and plenty about victims' rights, think again. These books are eye-openers. It turns out that the Build More Prisons movement and the victims' rights movement had a direct and close connection. So uh, with my guest authors here, let's begin with the history. Preliminarily, I want you all to know that during the conversation, I am going to refer to our criminal legal system and not to our criminal justice system, because in my view, we're not there yet. Achieving justice, in my view, in our criminal legal system is a work still in progress. So just know that. Um, so let's start with Bill Keller. Bill, Talk to us about how America became the incarceration nation with prisons and jails that can find millions of children and adults at a cost of, now wait for this because I thought I knew the cost, but after reading the book, this is what it costs, a trillion dollars a year or $450,000 per incarcerated person per year. And that's from, from Bill's book. And maybe he can talk to us about how he got that number because that is huge. And Bill, can you also tell us why we call prisons and jails a corrections system? What or who is being corrected? Uh, the the 450,000 number is something that came that some researchers came up with. And it's it, the traditional way of counting what it costs us to, to incarcerate so many people is to look at the budget for departments of corrections in 50 states and in the 18,000 counties and at the federal level and add them up and then throw in the pensions for corrections officers. And that gets you to about 45,000 per head. Um, what th these researchers did was try to appraise the social costs. Everything that, every cost that society pays as a whole um, to be the, the world's leading incarcerator. And so that includes lost income, lost child support, early, um, shorter um, longevity for people who've been in, impacted by the justice system, a whole range of issues and it comes up with that cost. You can argue, you know, you get a different number depending on how you define your numbers. 
but it it costs us a lot more than just what it says in the budget. Well, I mean, a trillion dollars is just huge. It's just, just uh, anyway, I, everybody should kind of absorb that number. And Bill, so what about the Ask history? How we got, how we got yeah. there, your other question? Yes. You know, one of the things that's interesting is we got there fairly recently mm -hmm. for most of the 20th century. Um, there was a, there's there, there, for 200 years, there's been a tension between the desire to rehabilitate and the desire to punish. Um, but for most of the 20th century, the incarceration rate in this country was pretty stable. It was larger than the more progressive developed countries of the world, but it wasn't as outrageous as it is now. Uh, it was about 100 people incarcerated for every 100,000 population. The, the country took a sharp punitive turn in the 70s, um, combination of some actual increase in crime uh, after a long period of relatively low crime and uh, the, the movement for black empowerment and the white backlash against it and uh, a number of politicians who saw an opportunity to exploit public fear. Uh, and so we went from 100 people, roughly 100 people incarcerated for every 100,000 population to 500 incarcerated for every 100,000. And that's not only puts us way out of whack with our own tr tr tradition and our own history, but out of touch with basically everybody else on planet Earth, except for maybe North Korea, <laughs> whose numbers we don't really trust. Wow. So, I mean, we've, we've come a long way from 1829, as you write in your book, when Charles Williams, prisoner number one, was confined at Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia. And that's where the Quakers, and as you write, other do-gooders came up with this bright idea, and I'm quoting from your book, to restore our fellow creatures to virtue and happiness and doing it with prolonged solitary confinement. So what were they thinking? Seriously, what, what was the thinking? The thinking was, I think, the, the genuine, a genuine feeling on the part of these mostly Quakers, um, Ben Franklin was among that group that the the group that argued for reform. The the basic idea that you would want to use prisons to improve somebody's chances of succeeding after prison is not a bad one. In fact, it's if any if there's a single point of my book, it's that we need to do more to prepare people to return to society because 95 percent of them do. Um, but the the notion that you could do that by keeping people in complete isolation was something that hadn't been tried before. And they very quickly learned as generations of corrections officials have learned since that solitary confinement, uh, prolonged solitary confinement can lead to severe mental illness. And it, and it is classified by the United Nations as a form of torture. Yeah, it's... Um... Well, it's interesting that back in the 1800s, they're saying prisons should do good things for people, but then of course they did just the opposite. Um, we, we just got a question in from one of our um, listeners, one of the uh, people in the audience, and I'll, Bill, I'll address this to you and then I'm gonna to move to Lenore. The question is how many people are incarcerated in US prisons today? And they haven't mentioned jails because sometimes people get confused about calling jails and prisons the same thing and they're very different. Jails are local, uh, institutions of incarcerating people in the prisons basically are isolated areas and they incarcerate people for a year or more and sometimes for life. So how many people are incarcerated today? Roughly 2 million. It's the, the most recent data update that I've seen, was, which was done by, uh, I think the Vera Institute, uh, was a little over 1.8 million. It fluctuates up and down. It hit, hit a peak in about 2008, and has been declining slightly, but not dramatically since then. Right. So, but that's and that is counting jails. The line between jails and prisons is a little blurrier because uh, a lot of jails have become like worse version of prisons. That is, they keep people for longer than the minimal amount of time, but they don't have any of the services that prisons right. have. Yeah. as meager as those are. Exactly. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Bill. Um, 
Lenore Anderson, uh, I loved your book and thank you for writing it. Uh, can you talk to us about the victims' rights movement that grew, in your words, and I'm quoting from the book, to become one of the most potent political forces in United States history, and how that led to the mass incarceration of low-income people and people of color? Sure. Uh, so just, you know, tying it to what Bill was just describing, you know, there was a variety of political um, developments in the 60s and 70s from backlash to the social justice movements of the time, as well as concerns about shifts in crime. One of the main responses politically was this call to protect the overlooked victims. Um, this was sort of the, the political t talk at that time. And there was a divergence of uh, different types of social justice activists and politicians who were concerned about crime, uh, whether that was because of the political benefit of standing up against crime or legitimately concerned about shifts in crime. And what happened is those forces kind of e evolved together through a very law and order centered call for victims' rights. Um, in the 80s and 90s, that's when we saw a dramatic increase in attention to victims' rights in the media and in political circles. And what that call typically was surrounded around was this idea that, you know, in the 60s and 70s, there was too many liberal judges giving too much um, rights, too many rights to people facing conviction. So we need to even out the playing field and we need to give victims more rights. And that's how we'll get to public safety. And so that idea of giving victims more rights took the form, took a couple of different forms. One form was actual courtroom rights, rec the ability to speak in court. Another was assistance, access to victim compensation and assistance. The third, however, was the more that you limit the rights of people being convicted of crime, somehow the better off victims are. And that third pillar of the victims' rights movement at that time really became a political justification for all those tough and crime laws. So the argument went, let's give compensation to victims, let's recognize victims in court, and let's drastically curtail access to pretrial release, access to rehabilitation inside prisons, access to consideration for release from prison or jail. And that will reduce crime and protect victims. That was sort of the political formula. Interesting. So um, who, who was it within, do, did at the time when this all this movement got going, were victims saying we want to be more punitive and lock them up longer? Were victims saying it or was this something, you know, was this a political thing from the outside doing this or a combination? Well, one of the things we know about then as well as today is that victims are not a monolith. It's critically important to understand that um, people who have been hurt by crime and violence have a widely divergent set of opinions about what the best way is to achieve public safety. Most of those opinions are actually not to strip the rights of, from people who are inside the justice system and build prisons. Most of the time, that's not actually what survivors want, either then or now. But when you talk about reducing rehabilitation as advancing victims' rights, that's very politically palpable, mm -hmm. right? At the time, it, the politicians in some ways, what I talk about in the book is sort of usurped that idea of victims' rights and turned it into a call for more money for bureaucracies. Once you start pouring all that money into the justice system in the name of victims, in the name of protecting safety, you build up these very politically powerful uh, criminal justice bureaucracies who have in some ways moral authority. You know, I, my organization, I work, I'm an advocate, we do work in state houses across the country and they're literally considered these public safety stakeholders. But when you ask, well, who is that? It's primarily the, the public system. It's the criminal justice bureaucracies who hold that mantle, but that's a very, powerful and influential mantle in discussions around public safety policy. Okay. 
But so when in I, some ways, yeah. Yeah, oh, sorry, just to, no, in ahead. some ways, victims were actually not included in the call for what mm. was uh, supposed to be in their names. That's interesting. I mean, I, I recall that. Can I ask Lenora a quick question? Sure. You know, it's it's human nature to feel some sort of sense of even vengeance, at least satisfaction, when you see these uh, prominent men who are being finally called to account for rapes. Uh, any, anybody who's been a victim knows that there's an emotional, sort of a visceral desire to get even. How do you address that? Sure. Well, first of all, it's really important to talk to survivors as part of public, public safety policy making. There's been a lot more rhetoric than there has actual discussions with diverse victims of crime from across the country. We have talked to, in the last decade, about 10,000 survivors of crime across the United States. And the, the opinions are widely diverse about what it looks like to achieve justice, what it looks like to achieve safety. But there's, there's one sort of very consistent theme across it, whether it's someone who you know, wants a maximum um, you know, sort of punishment or someone who has a, a, a restorative approach, kind of regardless, what you see is this idea that what people who have been hurt want is what happened to them to never happen again. And when you ask, well, what's the best way to reduce the likelihood that what happened to you will never happen again, preventing crime and violence and the, the well-known drivers of crime and violence rises to the top. And then secondarily, rehabilitation and making sure that when people return to our communities, they're prepared for long law-abiding citizenship. That's really what the vast majority of survivors of crime will define as the best pathway to public safety. That's not necessarily what you would know, it, you know, if you just turned on the local media or watched a, you know, sort of episode of Law and Order. It's presumed that there's this myth of the monolithic venge vengeful victim. But when you just let go of the stereotypes, let go of the myths and actually talk directly to people, you learn a very different pathway to public safety, one that's a lot more rational and frankly, a lot more in alignment with your vision for rehabilitation. Wow. Uh, you know, I, I, I recall when, when I was on the bench and, and I was a trial court judge in the mid 1990s, um, I became the first judge in California to require first time convicted drunk drivers to install breath devices in their cars. So which meant drivers had to blow into these devices. If they registered any alcohol, the ignition in the car would be disabled. So when I, when I imposed the sentence, instead of the standard sentence of jail, these are first time drunk drivers. Um, the local chapter of Mothers Against Drunk Driving were not supportive. They were entirely opposed. They wanted jail time, which was clearly not a deterrent, but it was punitive. Uh, this whole lock them up mentality. And um, that when I was on the bench, I felt that consistently when victims would make their statements in court. This is again in the mid 1990s. Um, so Bill, I'm, I'm gonna switch to you. you in your book, you talk about what happened when European style thinking was injected directly into the mainstream of a prison system here in this country. And I'm referring to of all places, North Dakota and Norway. So can you just kind of briefly tell us what happened? Sure. Uh, I knew almost nothing about the, the way they do prison in other countries when I started out on this. At the Marshall Project, we sent reporters along on trips with corrections officials to visit Norway and Germany and other Scandinavian countries. Uh, we're, not, we're not Norway. North Dakota is not Norway. You have to start by establishing that we're not going to, you know, Norway is a largely homogeneous, oil-rich welfare state, and we don't qualify on any grounds for that. But that doesn't mean we can't learn from their philosophy and their practice which is in, in, in this country, rehabilitation means, tends to mean uh, an array of programming. And, and, and I'm in favor of programming, especially the programming that works like, like higher education. But in the, in the more progressive European countries, it's, they start with a whole different premise, which is rehabilitation means 
uh, your job as a prison official is to ascertain what caused this person to commit the crime and what tools they need when they return to society to avoid falling into crime again. That's not the American philosophy. Um, so it, it, in Norway, for example, or Germany, there are a number of really striking differences. The, the sort of obvious one and one that um, sometimes lends itself to, to uh, criticism from the right um, is that the prisons are often more like college campuses than, than prisons. They don't have stacks of cages. Uh, and that's true. The more dramatic or more important difference is that in order to become a corrections officer in the United States, in most cases, you're going to have a few weeks of training, mostly focused on crowd control and self-defense. In Germany, for example, if you're, or Norway, if you're going to become a corrections officer, you're going to do two years of college level training, including studies of human rights law, psychology, sociology, um, and it's a, regarded as a prestige job. And uh, for an American corrections officer to have a relationship with an inmate, either a mentoring relationship or an advising relationship, or even just a courteous kind of how you doing today, fella, relationship is deeply frowned upon in, uh, in most prisons. You mentioned North Dakota, which is one of four states I've looked at, and there are others as well that have tried to adopt. They've actually done field trips to Norway and Germany and Sweden uh, and had officers from those countries come and visit with them. North Dakota was, is one that's done it as near as you can tell. These, these experiments are new, so there's not a lot of data to go on yet. So you have to judge by the sort of subjective opinions of people who deal with the system, both inside and out. Um, but it seems to work. So you start with the philosophy that your punishment is you're not going to be free for some period of time. And other, in every other respect, you retain your rights as a citizen, the right to safety, the right to education, the right to health care, the right to uh, spend time with your family. Um, and the... The, the Norwegians call it the normality principle, which is what, it's sooner or later, and in most cases sooner, these people are gonna be dropped back into the free world again. Um, they shouldn't, you, should, you wanna minimize the shock of that re-exposure. You wanna, if you can keep, the, the more you can keep their experience in prison normal, and including taking responsibility for your own food and clothing and going to a job during the day and taking it, taking courses in education, the more you can keep a kind of normal routine and normal sense of responsibility, the more likely it is that that person's going to adapt smoothly to back when he or she is released. So I'm going to switch gears a little. And again, I'd remind people, if you have any questions you'd like to join in the conversation, just uh, put in the chat on the YouTube channel. Uh, Lenore, uh, one of the things, the many things that I loved about your book was your stories about people um, and about just these anecdotes. And one of them was almost jaw dropping. So can you just briefly tell us what happened? This is April, 2021. Then California State Senator Mark Leno, who represented San Francisco's 11th district, he presented a bill to the state Senate's Public Safety Committee. And this bill was simply to authorize the release of terminally ill individuals from local jails to healthcare facilities and then to hospice. And I found your description of what happened when he introduced this compassionate release bill, which would seem to be just kind of a routine thing. It was anything but routine. Can you just briefly tell us what happened? Sure. The uh, bill, as you as you described, Judge, is really straightforward, and that's releasing people who are, um, you know, going to die within six months. It's extraordinary, uh, you know, burden on um, the health care system that can't adequately support people who are incarcerated and the people who work in prisons and jails and the people who live in prisons and jails. It just makes no sense. 
there was uh, the victims' rights organization stood up to oppose the measure. And what was so jarring about that opposition was this notion that releasing people who are terminally ill from prison is an affront to victims of crime. That is somehow something that victims of crime as a constituency for safety should be opposing. The, the, the stark difference between that political representation of victims and what we know happens in the neighborhoods and the everyday concerns of most victims of crime, you know, it, it couldn't be uh, more great. Um, this is, you know, the political activism around victims' rights in California. You know, the, the law and order victims' rights movement actually was birthed in the state of California and grew to its strongest in this state where victims' rights organizations would march on the Capitol every year, um, you know, chant in the 80s and 90s, build more prisons now, and then oppose every single attempt to either reform conditions inside prisons, increase rehabilitation, um, provide education, provide programming, or release people who would be way better um, suited for a medical environment. These kinds of you know, normal run-of-the-mill changes that legislators were trying to make constantly faced this stonewalling by what were these political victims' rights groups. But, but what, what's so important to understand is that most of these victims' rights groups were really not representative, right? When you talk about the majority of people who are hurt by crime and violence, um, you know, everyday concerns revolve around not hearing anything back from law enforcement, knowing nothing about what's going on in the investigation of the case, getting your victim compensation application denied, not being allowed to get victim assistance or relocation assistance, um, being uh, terrified on how you're going to help your children adjust if it's a homicide loss in a family. These are the kinds of concerns when you survey representative groups of victims that rise to the top. But then at that time in, in California, that political representation of victims was really um, this sort of permanent vengeance, you know, make everything as terrible as you possibly can for people inside. And that just is not accurate in terms of the representation. Okay, but this, this public safety committee hearing was just last year. Now, this was 2021, okay. right? So the bill, the, the, the bill that Senator Leno, then Senator Leno introduced this, that was actually in 2014, um, actually 2012, 2012. It was not 2012. 2021, it was 2012. Got it. I got my numbers fixed up. So, but but he he presents a bill that says these these people are terminally ill, and let's just you know release them because it's going to be less cost to the system. And it and it was the bill didn't even get out of the public safety committee. Can you just tell us eventually what happened with that bill? So Senator Leno, uh, relentless advocate for smart safety policies, was able to get that bill passed. Um, along with several others that took multiple iterations. And so that bill ended up moving forward despite the resistance. And that alone, um, Judge Cordell, is, is a turning point. When you start to see more and more legislators being willing to say, okay, maybe the representation of public safety in our committees, the public safety stakeholders, maybe that's not everyone out there. <laughs> when you start exactly. to see that shift, and Senator Leno was one of the big champions that helped the state of California make that turn. Right. And I recall reading in your book that he, he gave it three times. He had to go through these iterations or whatever, three times, but he stuck with it. And so uh, I, I think it's important to recognize he's a real hero when it comes to really being an advocate for what, what victims really want and also an advocate for those who are incarcerated who don't need to be incarcerated because of terminal illnesses. All right, so let me ask something of both of you. Um, systems, uh, be they legal systems, education systems, policing systems, corporate health systems, all systems, this is my view now, are resistant to change. And the incarceration system, the victim rights systems, they're no exception. Um, prison guard unions generally want no part of reforms. 
politicians, program administrators are not inclined to do things differently regarding victim assistance programs, as you just pointed out, Lenore. So I address this question to both of you. In your respective books, you describe changes that could transform America's incarceration system and changes that could transform our victims' rights system. So we're gonna talk about the changes and the reforms in a bit, but first, talk to us about re the resistance. Who are the resistors to change? How do we get them to open their eyes, their minds, and their hearts to moving in another direction? How do you persuade those in charge to stop resisting? Either one of you. Who are you first? <laughs> Well, we spend a lot of time um, trying to figure out that very question, which is how do you stop resistance to change, especially when the change is so common sense. Um, one of the things that uh, Alliance for Safety and Justice has done over the last decade is bring uh, representative groups of victims of crime up to state capitals to meet with legislators. And one of the reasons we do that is because there's something that happens when a legislator thinks they understand what it's like to be a victim of crime, thinks they understand what the justice system is good at and not good at, actually sits down in a room and listens. Um, you know, we've had um, survivors go to state capitals, many of whom have never been to their state capital. Um, and we bring uh, uh, buses, we have these annual events called Survivor Speak, where we bring hundreds of survivors up to state capitals. And then they walk the halls and they meet with legislators. And inevitably, legislators think they know what these survivors are going to say. The, oh, you want us to get tougher. Oh, you want us to just keep on going down the road of throwing all our money uh, toward the justice system. And when they sit down and they listen to people who have lost loved ones to crime and violence, who have been victims themselves, and they hear these groups of folks say, don't build that prison in my name. Why don't you instead put the money into these programs? I run a neighborhood program. Those kinds of stories are what you hear. So many of the solutions at the neighborhood level, level are survivor-led programs. And when legislators can make that connection, I mean, sometimes you could hear a pen drop in these rooms. They're so shocked at what they're hearing because it's counterintuitive. It's not what they would think. And that alone, that sort of let's meet, let's talk, let's build an actual relationship around solutions matters a ton to reduce resistance to change. I'll just put out another one, which is, sure. you know, organized communities um, <laughs> matter, right? We, we, we know that when we engage communities and give community organizations the support needed to talk to residents, to organize residents, the public systems that serve those residents start acting a lot different, okay? There's a real need for government to be accountable to the people they, that, it, that it serves. And that has not been the way government has traditionally worked. Um, you know, when we passed Proposition 47 in California, um, you know, there was such immense resistance to implementing R Proposition 47 from all sectors in the in the criminal justice system. Why don't you and let our attendees know what Prop 47 did, just briefly? Sure. This was a 2014 ballot initiative in California that took six low-level crimes and changed them from felony to misdemeanor and then right. requires the government to reallocate the, the prison dollars to community safety programs. Right you know, very common sense, but it faced immense resistance. From and home. a lot of that from, you know, district attorney's offices, right. sheriff's departments, police departments, um, you know, courtrooms. And a lot of that resistance to your point, uh, Judge, was we were asking these fiefdoms, these criminal mm -hmm. justice bureaucracies that are not used to doing things different to do their job different. Right. And it was like, oh, it's too hard to file the paperwork on a misdemeanor. It's too much work to go to court on that. It's too much of a hassle to drive people, you know, from one to another if it's only a misdemeanor. I mean, we heard every single possible reason except whether or not this policy was better for public safety. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really important 
you know, to organize communities and to continue to push for government accountability. We need oversight over the criminal justice bureaucracies. We need them to be accountable to the people who vote and to the people that they serve. And I think we'll start to see them open up their data and have a different conversation. Well, Bill, who are the resistors and how do we get them to change? Well, I, I would echo just about everything that Lenora said. Uh, but, but for the interest of time, I won't. I'll, I'll give a couple of other thoughts. Uh, uh, this is going to be an obvious answer for me because I've spent the last 50 years of my life as a journalist, uh, and I'm a great believer in transparency. Uh, I think one of the reasons that prisons have been so slow to reform is that there, those walls that keep people inside also keep prying eyes outside. Most people don't really know, except maybe from what they've seen on TV fiction, what goes on in prisons. So, and, and there are some encouraging signs in, in that regard. There are a number of programs that are actually training prison inmates to, per, to do journalism. Uh, and some of them are pretty damn good at it. The other thing I would say is the message that, that struck me about the case for rehabilitation, and I think strikes a lot of people by surprise, is that this is not a favor you're doing for people who did bad things. It's an investment in public safety. Um, every year, we release some, somewhere between 600,000 and 700,000 prisoners every year. And we have a choice that we can make as a society if, if, if it's presented to us. And I think how, I know how most people would choose. On the one hand, we can send them back in, out into the world alienated, brutalized, with no employable skills, uh, stigmatized so they can't get housing or, or a job. Or we can send them out with a concerted effort to make them prepared to be citizens and neighbors. I think if, if the choice is framed that way, most people would choose the latter. One would hope. Although, you know, I do note that during this midterm elections, the, the whole issue of crime and trying to instill fear in people that we were being overtaken by uh, criminals everywhere was, was utilized by some and by many in trying to, again, you know, get people f fearful and then to become more punitive. So what we we've still have, the fight continues, the struggle continues. Mm -hmm. uh, Lenore, we have a question from uh, uh, someone in the audience who wrote, um, are there any bills in California or other states to advance the protection of victims' rights that seem promising or might pass soon? Great question. And we've made a lot of progress in the last decade. Uh, a couple of uh, things that, my organization and many others have been able to uh, advance in California as well as Michigan, Pennsylvania, Texas, Florida is in reforms to the victim compensation system. You know, a lot of people who are not impacted by crime and violence don't have any idea how difficult it is to get help in the aftermath of crime. Um, you know, when you've survived violence, you face victimization debt. Um, including the inability to pay medical bills, the inability to uh, pay other kinds of debt that may have piled up um, when you haven't been able to work or when you lose a breadwinner from your house. Well, the government has a pot of money called victim compensation that is supposed to go to victims to help them prevent them from falling into insurmountable financial debt and poverty as a result of being hurt. But most victims don't get access to this at all. So there's a why, lot of- Why is that? Why is that? They don't get access for a couple different reasons. One is um, most victims are not told about victim compensation. Um, you know, a lot of people are not aware that the majority of crime and violence is not uh, reported or successfully prosecuted by the justice system. So what that means for someone is if there's no case, you don't get information, right? So most victims do not get told that they have a right to compensation or where to get it. Then even for victims who do get a right to compensation and be and told about it, they apply, okay? And these applications get routinely denied by these sort of opaque 
um, you know, non-responsive victim compensation uh, boards and the reasons for denial, um, no permanent home address. Well, what if you were homeless at the time that you became a victim? Another reason for denial, contributing to your own victimization. Well, what's an example of that? Um, you know, there was a, a shooting in Dayton, Ohio, um, you know, a person, a stranger, you know, shoots into a bar. So one of these uh, mass shooting incidents, people in the bar were denied compensation because they were under the influence of alcohol at the time <laughs> that the shooting occurred. This is what's considered contributing to your own victimization. It's insane. It's crazy. Right. So and, and, the, and the consequences are dire. I mean, when you do not help someone recover from either losing a loved one to homicide or violent crime, you are setting them up to be more vulnerable, whether it's economically or mental health wise. Right. So these services are public safety services. That's how yeah. we should think of victims' help. Anyways, yeah. we've changed these compensation policies in five different states, expanded eligibility. That's super exciting. And we've also been able to expand the number of trauma recovery centers across the country from just one to now 41, which is another solution. Wow. Bill Keller, you pose an interesting set of questions in this chapter with a great title, and the title's called What's Race Got to Do With It? Uh, so this is, this is from the book, from that chapter. You write, is racial inequity the root cause of mass incarceration, a contributing factor, or more of a collateral consequence? How you answer this question may tell you something about how you attempt to set things right. Do we treat these racial disparities as symptoms or as the disease itself? So in other words, is mass incarceration the result of systemic racism or is it the result of socioeconomic inequality? Because as you note, after all, the incarcerated include white people, most of whom are poor and low income. So what's race got to do with it, Bill? Just about everything. Um, the, the options are not mutually exclusive. Uh, it can. I, I do believe that racism is is in the system. Uh, I do believe that it's a consequence of economic and political inequity. Um, it, it's like a lot of things. It's complicated. Um, you know, everybody I think is familiar with Michelle Jones' book, The New Jim Crow. Michelle Alexander. And, Michelle, Michelle Alexander, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, get my Michelle's mixed up. Um, and I, I think she makes a persuasive case that you know, slavery evolved into um, sort of the criminal indentured servitude, uh, which involved, evolved into mass incarceration. But as you know, you know, 40 percent of the people who are incarcerated are black. That's another these 60% who are not. And you don't want to write them off as irrelevant to the argument because they're potentially allies. This is a point that uh, James Foreman at Yale makes. Um, it, it's about, he, he, he says, it's about race and, and you got to have something to go with, you know, the, with the and, the, it's, a, it's about race and it's about class. It's about race and it's about poverty. Um, because this shouldn't be, I mean, we're, we have a polarized enough electorate as it is now. It, it shouldn't be an us versus them debate whether or not you want to fix the criminal justice system. By the way, I, I'm glad you pointed out that we're, we've been going through another one of those election seasons when demagoguing on the subject of crime is popular. It's, we haven't got the final results from the elections yet, but it doesn't look like it was all that successful this time around, which I guess you could take as an encouraging note. It's a step. I can say that. Um, um, and, and maybe, you know, we'll, we'll come back to the, this issue of, of how much of what is going on in the mass incarceration system is really generated. As Michelle Alexander puts out, she, she just sees it as it's really totally the product of systemic racism. But let, let, let me ask Lenore a question. So I found so disturbing your discussion in the book of the practice, and it is a practice in some jurisdictions, of jailing victims. 
So if you could talk to us about what that's all about, and maybe if you can talk a little bit about Renata Singleton and what happened to her and how she took on the system. Sure. And, you know, I think there's, you know, disregard for victims of color and extreme incarceration rates for people in the justice system who are people of color. Those are two sides of the same coin. So when we when we talk about race and mass incarceration, we need to look at not just the rates of extreme disparities in incarceration, but also the rates of extreme disparities in who's hurt by crime and violence and who's least likely to get help to recover. Um, you know, we, we, we talk about the most harmed and the least helped. And I think that that's part of the racism of American criminal justice is who gets protection and who doesn't. And also who gets criminalized when they're actually survivors of crime and Renata's story is a perfect example of that. So uh, Renata uh, is, was in New Orleans um, and she uh, was in a inter interaction with her then boyfriend at the time who was arrested on a misdemeanor uh, domestic violence battery charge. And later uh, she sought to, um, you know, she just said she wanted to drop the charges and move on. They had broken up. Um, the uh, New Orleans uh, prosecutor's office arrested her to compel her testimony and put her in the Orleans Parish uh, prison in New Orleans. She was there for nearly a week, um, unable to care for her children, um, unable to return to work, terrified. Um, when she was finally released, she goes to court and the person who the misdemeanor case was against had not spent a single day in jail. So he was released immediately because it was misdemeanor, uh, shows up to court. Um, she was held for five days. There, were, there was a report, uh, an organization called NOLA Court Watch um, did a report on the jailing of victims of crime in New Orleans at the time. 150 people over a five year period who were all victims of crime were arrested and jailed for compelling their testimony. The backgrounds of these survivors were distinct, whether it was shooting or domestic violence or trafficking as in terms of what they had been a victim of. But the number one similarity is we're talking about almost exclusively low income people of color. You don't get a right to an attorney when you're a victim you don't get a right to call <laughs> and get help from someone to get out. Um, and that's what happened to Renata. Now she joined uh, with a, a group of, uh, a, a, another group of people who had been uh, erroneously incarcerated as victims and they sued um, along with you know, the ACLU and support from Civil Rights Corps, remarkable organizations doing litigation work. Um, and they ended up winning that lawsuit to prohibit the New Orleans County um, Prosecutor's Office from filing charge, you know, from arresting and jailing victims. Um, and what's so remarkable is the extraordinary effort it took. I mean, this was national media. You know, everyone was disgusted by this idea that you would take a victim of domestic violence or trafficking or shooting and put them in jail. But it took years and years and years of intensive litigation to turn that around and to actually win that lawsuit. But they Amazing. won in 2021. Amazing. And I'm assuming jailing victims is just not uh, relegated solely to New Orleans, correct? I mean, it's done other there, places. Yeah, there are, there are uh, other prosecutor offices and, mm -hmm. and judges who authorize the jailing of victims to, to horrific outcomes. Um, you know, many victims who have been jailed report um, extreme PTSD, um, report uh, being terrified to leave their cells for fear of becoming a victim again. Um, you know, just horrifying uh, psychological, physiological impacts on people because the conditions are so horrifying yeah. in general. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is all, you know, allegedly in the name of public safety. Most prosecutors who are reasonable uh, would never engage in this kind of behavior. There's so many other ways that you could encourage someone to mm -hmm. participate if that were Absolutely. your goal. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you see why I resist calling it a justice system. I mean, there's just so much that needs to be fixed. Bill, we have a question from you from uh, someone in the audience. 
uh, it is this. You talk about how much the United States spends per prisoner. How does that compare to other countries? Can you give examples of how much they spend and what the biggest differences are? The more progressive countries, this is not something that everybody likes to hear, but doing it well is not cheap. Um, the, sta the staffing ratios, the infrastructure you have to develop to, to convey a sense of norm normality, um, the training that goes into preparing people to be mentors and sort of more like social workers and less like, like paramilitary. All of that's expensive. I haven't done a comparative, comparative per, you know, per capita cost, but it's, it's clearly greater. Of course, they're incarcerating a lot fewer people too. Right. So, right. But I, I do know that um, if you want to know, for example, how much correctional officers, and again, I get to correction, I don't know what they're correcting, but prison guards, uh, to, how much they make, for example, uh, there's a website called um, Transparent California, and they have data on every person who is a public employee in California, what their salaries are, what benefits are. So if people are interested, you might want to check it out. I think you'll be stunned to find out how much some of these folks are making. Um, so I, I'm going to jump back just very briefly to Lenore, because it, you, know, you have wonderful little anecdotes in, in your book. And, and one of them, you talk about a Missouri prosecutor named uh, Jean Peters Baker. Uh, someone who you describe as demonstrating humility and focusing on listening to victims. So just in, in just a minute or two, can you just kind of briefly tell us about what she did? When, when Jean Peters Baker became the prosecutor uh, for uh, the Jackson County in Missouri, she found out that four out of five victims of non-fatal shootings, there was no prosecution. Nothing happened in response at all. Four out of five non-fatal shooting victims. She was shocked to learn this in part because she knows that that's the only way that victims would ever hear about victim services. So she decided to um, give her victim services division authority to go knock on doors, not to talk about the case, but to bring a casserole, a, a you know, sort of metaphorical casserole, right? She's um, of the mindset that if you get to know your neighbors and you help them out, that that's the best way you could have a safe community. So she started doing um, house visits and deliveries of food and found people terrified, isolated, uh, not w having lost economic um, stability, risking getting kicked out of their homes. So they built a whole program around that, delivering food, helping you with compensation applications, helping you with relocation, literally repairing bullet wounds in walls. I mean, these this are, was these are prosecutors, right? Victim services staff in the prosecutor's offices mm -hmm. going out and doing, I mean, we're talking the most basic uh, demonstration of giving someone human dignity, giving someone respect. That's what so many survivors of harm uh, deserve and need, um, and you know it just isn't what's happening on the normal on the normal basis. And was she successful? Were people more forthcoming? And they they were able to really uh, build a whole program. It started off just sort of going to a couple of doors and knocking and talking to people and see what would happen. And now they have a whole full service um, out in the community victim services division. And they're seeing uh, survivors get way more access to the kind of stability that they need so that they're safer and less likely to get hurt again. Um, you know, repeat victimization is one of the things you're really trying to change here. And if you can get victims help the first time, you reduce the likelihood they're gonna get shot again. So casseroles, right? I mean, if we need to get the word out, casseroles <laughs> make a difference. Um, Bill Keller, um, let's talk solutions. Um, if we don't outright abolish prisons and there are advocates for that, what are prisons for? Well, we have a pretty good idea of things, both broad scope and narrow scope that make a difference uh, on the on the more targeted and but widespread solution. Education is the one that's got the best documentation, I think. The Rand Corporation has done a lot of studies 
meta studies that show that uh, if your measure of success is recidivism, education and particularly post-secondary education uh, can rather dra drastically decrease the rate of recidivism. Um, there, there are lots of lots of individual programs, and I the people some of the heroes in my book are the people who are teaching or counseling or trying to reform the system. I, I don't think the idea of systemic reform gets enough attention. It gets attention from the abolitionists who I have sort of mixed feelings about. Um, what are the mixed feelings you have? The, sorry? What are the mixed feelings you have about the abolitionists? Uh, on the one hand, I have immense respect for the abolitionists because they've been um, often the first to identify the problems in, this, in the criminal justice system uh, and indict, indicting the, the people who were doing it wrong and setting up a kind of popular countermeasure against the fear mongering. Uh, and I have two problems with the abolitionists. Um, one of them is, uh, I'm not sure that it's a realistic thing to dream in about. I mean, yes, um, marriage equality was something that nobody imagined would happen. Abolishing slavery was something no, at one point nobody would believe would happen. So maybe it's a shortage of imagination, but I, I find it hard to believe that you could do away with policing and prisons and not have something else grow up, maybe something even worse that would take their place. And the other misgiving about, about it is, what about the people who are stuck in the system now? It, it seems unkind to say to them, you have to wait till the revolution comes before you get to sign up for an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting or a, or a college course. And uh, sometimes the perfect can be the enemy of the good. So just to follow up, so one was solution or what prisons are for is education, getting an education because that's been demonstrated to reduce recidivism. Anything else that prisons, what prisons should be for? Well, they should be for the whole battery of rehabilitation program. That, that's shorthand for what they should be about is, is returning people to the free world capable of being good citizens and good neighbors. Um, I mean, there's a long laundry list of the kinds of programming that works, everything from arts programming to um, behavioral modification programs, restorative justice, which is often thought of as a, something that you do instead of courts, has also gotten a foothold in some prisons and, and has been useful, you know, where you have these programs where the, the person who's been convicted of a crime sits down across the table from a victim right. and they talk about consequences and right. what the pain is like. Well, Nora Anderson, in, in what ways can we, and I'm quoting from your book, in what ways can we truly set out to see all victims and build something safer in their names? Well, we need to, you know, as I said earlier, we need to uh, have a totally new lens. Um, we need to engage in conversations with communities about um, who's vulnerable um, and what it looks like to build up real prevention, real preventative community-based solutions. There are so many examples. Um, you know, Real Partnership has uh, reduced homicide rates in cities like Newark, New Jersey, that uh, slashed its homicide rate after the mayor brought in and created the Newark Community Street Team. These are neighborhoods, these are residents who are doing conflict mediation in the community, walking kids to school. They built a trauma recovery center. Survivor-led solutions made that city safer. That's just one example of what it looks like when you engage with survivors in a process of developing the, a new lens for public safety. We also have to really think about where the money goes. Um, you know, some of the best programs I've seen at the neighborhood level are operating on a dime. Meanwhile, you've got, as, as Bill points out, trillions of dollars going to um, these sort of uh, run-of-the-mill bureaucratic decisions. So the more that we can invest in neighborhood solutions, the safer we're all going to be.
So we got another interesting question from our audience. How did each of you get involved in your work? So if you can keep it brief, because we are coming toward the end of our time together. How did each of you get involved in your work? Bill? Uh, sure. Um, in 2014, a guy named Neil Barsky, who, who was, had been a reporter and then made a bunch of money as a, a trader and had become a philanthropist, called me up and said he wanted to start a nonprofit news organization to deal with criminal justice reform. Uh, I had, except for a brief time doing night cops beat for the Oregonian when I was a cub reporter, I had never really covered criminal justice. Um, but I spent some time reporting it and, and then spent five years at the Marshall Projects immersed in the subject with a, a really crack group of reporters and editors. And I got hooked. Fantastic. I am hooked on the Marshall Project as well. And full disclosure, I do uh, donate every month. And I think it's terrific. Uh, Thank you. Lenore. Sure. Lenore. Well, I was a troublemaker when I was in high school. Oh, good. Um, you know, <laughs> and, um, it, you know, police took me home instead of taking me to juvenile hall. Um, teachers allowed me to pass classes I didn't deserve to pass. And I did not understand um, the scope and scale of um, extreme privilege that I was um, experiencing when I was needing second and third chances on my way to adulthood. It wasn't until I graduated from law school 10 years later um, that I was sitting in courtrooms representing children facing time behind bars that I really understood uh, what it means uh, to be uh, a, a youth of color in the United States. Um, you know, that literally the war on drugs, the war on um, crime, the war on youth really was actually a war on youth of color in the United States. And when I saw that I never met a child in facing time behind bars um, that didn't start off doing some of the little stupid things that I was doing when I was a kid, when I saw that, um, I made a commitment to advance racial equality as my life's work. So we've come to uh, the point in our time together when we have just time for one more question. And I'm just going to ask you maybe in 30 seconds each to answer this final question. What gives you hope? Lenore, what gives you hope? The people on the ground who are organizing for change, um, you know, we saw this last election cycle, an attempt to revert back to 1990s style tough on crime. And there it was mixed results, but by and large, voters rejected that. They rejected that because people, everyday people, survivors, people who have been incarcerated, have been organizing nonstop for the last 20 years. That organizing is starting to pay off. There's been a broader cultural shift. People don't buy it anymore that you can just lock your way up to safety. And we owe that to the grassroots organizers. And that's who gives me hope. Wow. Bill Keller, what gives you hope? It's hard to find hope when we, the, the correction system acts as a kind of catch basin for all of the poisons in our society racism, poverty, class warfare, et cetera, that all drains down into our prison system. And you can't fix the prison system without doing something about all those forces in society. That said, I, like Lenore, I find my hope in individual individuals who have committed their time, their resources, if they have them, to trying to fix lives one at a time. Fantastic. Well, Thank you both. Thank you both. And I'm so glad you're doing the work that you are doing. Our thanks to Bill Keller, author of What's Prison For? Punishment and Rehabilitation in the Age of Mass Incarceration. And big thanks to Lenore Anderson, author of In Their Names, The Untold Story of Victims' Rights, Mass Incarceration, and the Future of Public Safety. Thank you both for joining us today. We encourage everyone to purchase these new books at your local bookstore. If you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making virtual and in-person programming possible, please visit commonwealthclub.org slash online. I'm Ladaris Cordell. Thank you and stay safe.